Borderlands DLC are some of the best additional content you can get for your money. Borderlands 3 DLC on the other hand, let's find out. Now I'm not going to mention all the exclusive weapons and gear, because that's not what you're here for. You play these DLC to expand your knowledge of the world and overall narrative. Unless you're trying to complete a build, which is what I'm doing. That's why I bought the DLC. If you're going to buy any DLC, please don't buy them separately. Get them in a bundle. I recommend the Ultimate Edition bundle. Do not buy the Pandora's Box collection. That comes with new tales from the Borderlands, and your wallet will appreciate not buying new tales. So, as I'm sure you're aware from my previous video that you should go watch, yes, it's rough around the edges, but it's a labor of love. I mentioned briefly two DLC for cut content with no clear distinction. The designer's cut gives you four new skill trees, one for each class. Yes, paywalling gameplay features that should have been in the base game. Borderlands 2 would never. So Arms Race is the actual content of the DLC. The thing Axton and Salvador's been bugging you about through the entire game. And to be honest, it slaps. Everyone starts off with no items and no action skills, so which class you pick doesn't matter except when it comes to which dedicated drops you want to farm. Right off the bat, it's heavily inspired by battle royales, with a ring closing every so often. Looks like Randy Pitchford's eating good with that Epic Games Fortnite money. Since builds don't transfer over, it's purely skill-based with map knowledge. I know, skill in my Borderlands game? I can't one-shot every enemy I see? Absurd. But besides the loot you get, there's no real reason to play Arms Race. It is a huge time sink and very unforgiving. You could spend hours trying to farm for that one legendary. If you don't get it, you have to restart the entire game mode. Waiting for the long ass 10 second countdown, run, fight, try not to die. If you don't extract your items, you lose everything. You do get that small sense of progression like you get from battle royales or MOBAs, going from weak and vulnerable to dominating enemies. My biggest gripe is that you don't get enough time to enjoy arms race. At most you can reach maybe 3 specific locations before the ring completely closes, and oftentimes you might leave empty handed. While arms race is fun, I'd rather progress in story missions. So, if you're getting sick of arms race, and just want your loot, try this instead. Equip a revolter shield. On action skill start, activate any effects that trigger on shield. You find this on Sumo in the Director's Cut DLC, which we'll get into later. I shouldn't have to tell you this, you can look it up yourself. As you can see, once you use your action skill, you become shock enraged, doing bonus shock damage for 15 seconds. Drop your shield while you're still shock enraged, once the electricity goes away, equip a different shield. You keep the shock damage, which means... Now some of you may ask, is this cheating? Yes. We're essentially cutting our farming time in half, making up for the countless bullshit attempts. So find a one-shot or high rate of fire weapon and go have fun. Yes, more cut content. Here you get to face Hemavorus, a raid boss that is quite enjoyable. Even Vermivorous makes a return. But goddamn is it expensive. It used to cost 25 Iridium per run. Inflation hit hard. Fair warning, once you're in the pit, you will be humbled. Anything less than a perfect build? Good luck. We also get vault cards that give us more loot. Again, should have been in the base game. If you bought this DLC late, you have to work full time to catch up and gain the experience you need to collect all the gear. I thought this was supposed to be fun. Included as well are behind the scenes concept art, storyboards, and clips. This is where we find the iconic deleted scene of Maya's funeral, where Lilith and Ava come to terms with their mistakes. Ava got Maya killed, and we seem to forget, but Lilith got Roland killed. I didn't speak about Ava in my last video that you should definitely watch, because what could I say that hasn't already been said? Me personally? I don't mind Ava's existence. I think it's charming for Maya to have a Siren Apprentice. Ava simply didn't have any reason to be in the game. You could take Ava out of the story and have her be replaced with just Maya and nothing would have changed. Probably be better. Out of all the characters that needed character development, Ava is that character. We needed her to slowly show the traits of being a leader, and worthy of becoming Maya's successor. And the deleted scene presented exactly that. But canonically, this scene never happened. So by having this, 
it arguably made fans more upset. The last time we've actually interacted with Ava before she gets rewarded with Siren powers was her scolding Lilith. But I'm getting ahead of myself. This isn't about Ava. This is about the DLC where the main selling point is helping Ava with her podcast. It's not as bad as it sounds. I think people were very dismissive because Ava's the focal point of the DLC and the price, but we already knew that. This is one of the few moments of character development we have from Ava, so I appreciate every chance we got. It's one of the shorter storylines that expands the overall ethos significantly, but it's only hampered by the endless waves of enemies. It doesn't help that this is one of the more important storylines that could directly lead to the events of the next game, but a third of the content is kind of filler. Like it does set up something much larger, but it takes a while to get there. How do we go from solving murder mysteries to fighting God? So the scrap DLC for Borderlands the pre-sequel finally makes its way. A whole casino planet where all the guests are trapped inside is a great premise, but here it feels more style over substance. Only time will tell if I'll actually become nostalgic for the new characters. Besides Timothy, Flapstructor is my favorite. He actually had a character arc, if you can believe it. And the twist with Freddy made him a lot more interesting than he needed to be. Overall, it's a standard assemble all your teammates and take down the bad guy heist type story, with the bad guy being nothing special. If you love listening to Handsome Jack, you're gonna love hearing a lot from him. The fact that Timothy has some of Jack's DNA and we hear him fight with his other personality, fighting with himself basically, adds more charm to his character than previous interactions. We never get to hear Jack sound so vulnerable and self-loathing until now. Plus, the new designs for Jack and the loader bots are clean. Going back to what I said about how genius the design of Borderlands 2 was by having loader bots, we now have an entire DLC with loader bots. The real star of the show is the space station itself. And yes, it hits. Everything you could want in a casino aesthetic is all here. It is quite sick. However, it doesn't make me want to stay for long. Almost like that's a plot point for the DLC. In all honesty, this is Timothy's story, more than anything. And I'm glad we can have some closure to a fan favorite character. Guns, Love, and Tentacles, or Hammerlock's Big Gay Hunt, as some people like to call. Not me, of course. I have standards. Where this DLC shines the most is scale. Holy crap, do you feel insignificant to everything. I look up and I'm just awestruck like the planet's gonna eat me. However, I'm not a big fan of stupid ass snowy tundras. I prefer dry sandy deserts, and you can thank games like Borderlands for that. I do admire how varied the locations are, from town center to library to frigid mountains to monster guts. You wanna think all of these came from the same DLC. I found it cute that Claptrap still calls Gage Minion. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is this the first time we've seen Claptrap interact with the Borderlands 2 Vault Hunters in Borderlands 3? It's impressive that they still kept the theme of love and romance in a cosmic horror setting. This is another one of those stories where the goal isn't as strong. Wainwright gets possessed by a ring, and we need to travel across the whole planet for methods of removing it. Stopping the cult is secondary to the actual objective. If we never got involved in the first place, the cult would still be doing its thing, and that's it for the planet, I guess. Sometimes we stray so far from the main objective that I forget why we're doing it. It's only when Hammerlock reminds us through his doubts of marrying Wainwright that I feel engaged. Very nice play on words. But his lack of confidence is never the actual focus. So many plot lines and characters we need to follow. And while the villains probably have the strongest motives, personally, I don't care about the backstory of characters who I will immediately forget as soon as we defeat them. While I like the enemy designs, the bosses don't leave a lasting impression, and I feel like they're just slightly bigger versions of the enemies we fight. The irony is that I remember the boss fights because of how unmemorable they were. Except for this one. This one was kind of sick. The whole point of the DLC was to take off the ring, but in the end, it lost power and we decided to keep it. I thought this was going to take us somewhere else, judging by how tense our couple felt. But nah, it just ended. It's still cute. I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel something. You know you got yourself a good DLC when most of the complaints are that it's too short. There is some legitimacy to that. The story for DLC is stronger than it's ever been. It gives me hope that future titles can be just as good. The narrator reminds me of a game with a similar premise. 
Call of War as Gunslinger. Except in that game, the narrator is a character you're playing as, and usually comments outside of gunfights. Here, I have no idea who's talking or why. And, hot take? It gets exhausting. It's like if Marcus narrates your entire story in the base game, but you never get to meet Marcus. Regardless, the new location is beautiful. There was no holding back to make this a living, breathing world. There is very little comedy. It feels like you're playing Borderlands 1. It feels like we've been taken back in time, out of place, like we're on a movie set. It's the most unreal experience I've ever felt in Borderlands 3. Not a single character returns, which means that they're that confident about the DLC and its characters. Again, time will tell if characters like Juno or Titus holds up. Gearbox wins if I actually start thinking about them in my 60s when Borderlands 10 comes out. I know no one else cares, but can we take a moment to appreciate how sick these fonts are for the title screen and character intros? The villain Rose definitely holds up. While I still don't know her motivation, she had me hooked. But that's the issue. It's never clear why she wants to blow up the planet Handsome Jack style. Or maybe I'm just stupid, maybe I'm not reading between the lines. But to me, the ending could have been more satisfying. Instead, I'm left feeling empty. We never really got a chance to understand Rose. And while Echo Logs help, they shouldn't be necessary. Good DLC, but disappointing. As soon as you go inside Krieg's mind, it slaps you in the face with an overdose of music and colors. But this time, it's actually kind of fucking awesome. Krieg stands out so much from every Vault Hunter we played just by his very existence being a psycho and literally hearing his thoughts. So having an entire DLC dedicated to understanding more of his character is exciting. I'm noticing a lot of story missions involve gathering MacGuffins. Not like it's a bad thing, but it starts to become formulaic and predictable when you realize everything becomes gather three of this before we move to the final event. But I mean, holy shit, this is a magnificent DLC. It tugs at the heartstrings a bit. Not quite the emotional roller coaster of Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon's Keep, but pretty damn close. Very reminiscent of the claptastic voyage from the pre-sequel, which many have claimed is the best Borderlands DLC. There is not a single moment where I'm not genuinely curious where the plot's going to take us. All the set dressing, everything is larger than life, like a surreal painting much bigger than it has any right to be. The humor is there too, less loud equals funny and more goofy and strange. This DLC tells us less about the world and more about Krieg, which I'm all for. What's surprising is that there aren't any new characters, only looking at old characters in a different perspective. If you ever wonder what it's like to fight the Borderlands 1 Vault Hunters, you finally got it. And yes, it is quite sick. However, while the DLC gave us a lot of information, it didn't tell us anything we couldn't figure out on our own. Just bits of Krieg's past that was never fleshed out. Like yeah, it was never explicit that Krieg was experimented on by Hyperion. But it's not surprising either. Evil scientists are evil. Who would have thought? His past before becoming a psycho is still unknown. And I think they still want to keep it a mystery. Despite taking place on a smaller scope, it feels like we're making a big impact. We're not changing the world or community or anything like that. We're saving a life, which is enough to change their world or something. I don't know. I'm not your therapist. So yeah, good DLC. Go outside.